Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School, July 5th, the first Sunday in July, the day after we celebrated Independence Day. We're going to start the first Sunday School of the month with Down the Street We Go, so if you want to stand and sing with me. Thank you once again for opportunity to have Sunday School, Lord, a digital Sunday School, a remote Sunday School, but a Sunday School nonetheless, Lord, where we get together, where we sing songs of praise to you, Lord, where we have some time to look at your word and study it, and Lord, where we have a time just to come together, if not physically, then spiritually as brothers and sisters in Christ and worship you and love you. Lord, I pray that you would bless our Sunday school time. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin today, as I've just mentioned, it is July 5th. So it's the day after we here in the United States celebrate our independence. I'm sure some of you from overseas who are watching have no idea what we're talking about. But good portion of you are from here in these United States. And uh, because of that, let's, uh, let's take a moment. You'll see we have these uh, flags here. These were given uh, in memory of uh, Reverend Sterling Helmer, who was a uh, interim pastor for us a long time ago when Harmony Bible Church uh, first started. And those flags were given in, given in his memory. So what I'd like to do today, we don't do this too frequently, but would you please join me as we pledge allegiance to the flag, to the Christian flag, and to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. You can be seated. Okay. Next song. Pastor Jason Pauley is a fan of the Blind Boys of Alabama, a gospel singing group. This is one of their songs. Uh, hold on, let me turn the right page. This is uh, Jesus on My Mind. Lyrics are pretty easy. When you see me coming, I've got Jesus on my mind. I've got to have Jesus, Jesus all the time. When you hear me praying, I've got Jesus on my mind. I've got to have Jesus, Jesus all the time. When you hear me singing, I've got Jesus on my mind. I've got to have Jesus, Jesus all the time. And every day I live, I've got Jesus on my mind. I've got to have Jesus, Jesus all the time. <laughs> Coming, 
I've got Jesus on my mind, oh, when you see me coming. I've got Jesus on my mind, oh, when you see me coming. I've got Jesus on my mind, oh, I've got to have Jesus, Jesus all the time. When you hear me praying, I've got Jesus on my mind, oh, Check the description down at the bottom and I'll include a link to uh, the five blind boys of Alabama singing that song. They do a much better version than I do. And there's one guy, the high tenor. It's fantastic. You have to hear it. You can't help but uh, smile when you hear them do it. Okay, it's time, oh, it's time for the announcements. Announcements, announcements, first Sunday in July announcements. We'll do the birthdays here in just a sec. Um, hey, speaking of people potentially watching from overseas, Frank in Africa, I think I mentioned him last week um, when my daughter Julia went to Uganda on a two week mission trip when she was 16, so quite a few years ago. She met a couple of guys, Frank and Forrest, and uh, they have uh, sort of befriended the entire Batty family, uh, especially Frank. He checks in with someone very regularly, and the church has done some um, offerings to help Frank in his mission to reach young people in Uganda. And actually, he joined us for prayer meeting on Tuesday night. And what a fantastic and sweet fellowship that was. And again, how amazing that he's in Uganda in Africa on his phone and we were having a Zoom meeting. And the latency, the lag time, there was there was none. It was fantastic. It was just like he was, you know, in mid coast Maine, just like the rest of us were. Um, it was great. Um, his laughter was infectious. Uh, he's very positive and a very happy guy, and everybody was blessed, I'm quite sure, Tuesday evening to have him uh, on there. So uh, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, which is when I assume most of you are watching this, our morning worship service is at 11, and uh, we're going to have communion as our first communion back. Uh, what we'd like to do, again, if you're watching this from home, we're going to make a big U-shaped um, sort of line around the church. We're going to leave the elements up here on the communion table. If you pass by, pick one piece of bread, pick one juice, and then go back and sit down. And, and that way, um, we aren't passing the plate and only the person that prepares communion, which is either going to be me or Susan, um, will be the only ones that have uh, touched it other than you. So we're going to try and uh, keep everyone safe and do communion in this manner. Just one more thing. One of those things that we are doing because of COVID. Okay, it's time for the birthday basket. For those of you who are celebrating birthdays in July, I had to take notes. July is a busy month here at Harmony Bible Church. 
So, if I call your name, you're going to receive a fantastic prize from this fabulous prize basket. First up, July 8th, Julia Batty. Yay! It's her birthday. Does she still tell how old she is? 22. Julia's 22 this year. And Julia gets a steak. Wow. That's unfortunate that a vegetarian pulls the steak out of the prize package. July 16th. Kim Smith, she's uh, celebrating her birthday. And Kim reaches in and pulls out an ice cream cone. Fantastic. Kim, I'm sure that you are going to enjoy that. Happy birthday. Uh, July 23rd, Nathaniel Batty, son of my right hand. And he reaches into the prize basket and pulls out Oh, that's right. He gets the giant sunflower wind thing. Wow. All right. I hope you like that, Nathaniel. Also born July 23rd. Who would imagine? Matthew Batty, son of my left hand. Matthew reaches in, and what does he pull out? A large French fry. Who knew we had hot food in the... Uh, in the prize basket. I didn't know. July 26. I told you we had a lot of people. Richard Wall. Richard Wall pulls out a Chevy pickup truck. Oh, I bet he's disappointed with that. Richard, a hardcore Ford man. Uh, July 27th. Dale of the famous Lucy and Dale. What does Dale reach in and get? Wow, a new 80-foot travel camper. Woo, that's a nice prize. Congratulations, Dale. You may have to get another lot there in the campground to house that puppy. Uh, somebody else was born on that same day, July 27th. Dan Latai. Dan has been attending Harmony recently. He's been coming to the, the church uh, services. Has, I don't think he's been to Sunday school yet, but his birthday is the same day as Dale, so we will celebrate with him. Uh, what does Dan get? A plate of fresh cookies. Congratulations, Dan. And on the day that you are probably watching this, July 5th, there's an anniversary Larry and Tracy Aiken celebrate their anniversary this very day. So, happy anniversary to that lovely couple. Uh, they are now living down in Florida, where it is 437 degrees today. Stay cool. Last week, I mentioned that I had a Hebrew word that I wanted to potentially look at. Uh, this week here in Sunday School. But in the meantime, a question came in. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I thought we should cover it today. What exactly was the question? Hey, Bill, uh, I was just thinking it would be cool if you talked a little bit about how come David's rock from his sling actually killed Goliath. I would expect it to just like ping off his head and not even hurt him. Thanks, Heather. How does Goliath die from a rock? Let's go over that story. And, and this is Sunday school, so this is the time where it's appropriate to ask these kinds of questions, and it's also good for us to go over these stories. When I was a kid, this sort of thing, you know, was covered in Sunday school 
with little kids. And our culture is, is changing in there. You know, we, we don't have the kids in Sunday school that we once did. However, we have some adults and we, we have some new believers. We have adult believers who may have never heard these stories or they've, they've heard them in passing. I mean, David and Goliath, it's in our culture, you know, the, the big and the strong against the weak and the weak overcome and, you know, that sort of theme. Um, you know, we might hear about it in court cases, you know, the Goliath of the big company and then there's the big little David who's the little old lady who has to, you know, whatever. So the, the symbolism of David and Goliath, we might know, but we might not actually know the story all that well, especially if, if we are new to the faith. So that story is told in our Bibles in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And just by way of background, Saul, King Saul, is ruling Israel at this time. He is Israel's first king. However, he was disobedient to the Lord, and the Lord has decided that he is going to replace Saul. He rejects Saul, and instead he sends Samuel to anoint David, and that's what happens in chapter 16. And um, this is done at this point secretly. This is a sort of a private installation of David as king, but he's not come forward to the Israelites to be declared king. So that's what's happened in chapter 16. So sort of remember that in the background, that the plan is in place for David to become the new king of Israel. So 1 Samuel 17, and we're going to read the whole chapter. It's a, it's a lot to cover, um, but I want, to, I want to cover the whole thing, and then we'll, we'll talk about it, and then we'll get to Heather's question. But 1 Samuel 17, 1 says, The Philistines gathered their forces for war, at Soko in Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Saul and the men of Israel gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and they lined up in battle formation to face the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on one hill, and the Israelites were standing on another hill with a ravine between them. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. He was nine feet nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins, and a bronze javelin was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam, and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. He stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations, Why do you come out to line up in battle formation? he asked them. Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose, excuse me, choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. When Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. Now David was the son of an an Epaphrite from Bethlehem of Judah named Jesse. Jesse had eight sons during Saul's reign and was already an old man. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war, and their names were Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, and next, and Shammah, the third. And David was the youngest. The three oldest had followed Saul, but David kept going back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flocks in Bethlehem. Every morning and evening for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand. One day, Jesse had told his son David, Take this half bushel of roasted grain along with these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Also take these ten portions of cheese to the field commander. Check on the well-being of your brothers and bring a confirmation from them. 
They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle, uh, excuse me, lined up in battle formation, facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking with him, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him, terrified. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, Do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The troops told him about the offer, concluding, that is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's, David's oldest brother, Eliab, listened as he spoke to the men, and he became angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked. Why did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. What have I done now, protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him to others in front of him and asked about the offer. The people gave him the same answer as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. So he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight against this Philistine. But Saul replied, you can't fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. And he's been a warrior since he was a young boy. David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defiled the army of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul had his own military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor. David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. Instead, he took his staff. He took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then, with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came closer and closer to David, with the shield bare in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him, because he was just a young, healthy, and handsome boy. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. To me. Today I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. When the Philistine started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, and hit the Philistine on his forehead. The stone, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. 
David overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. David ran and stood over him. He grabbed the Philistine's sword, pulled it from its sheath, and used it to kill him. Then he cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry, and chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Philistine bodies were strewn all along the Saharim road to Gath and Elkron. Let's ask the Lord to uh, bless our study time together. Father, as we more fully consider your word now, we would ask your Holy Spirit to guide us as we look at what's written here, to discuss it, to understand it, and then, Lord, to ultimately apply it to our lives, to see, Lord, that it is not by sword or by shield that we defeat your enemies, Lord, but that you are in control. And even things that may seem insurmountable to us, they are a tiny thing for you, Lord, the God of the angel armies. Lord, we ask your blessing this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, um, in this particular, we'll sort of start in the beginning of the chapter. So, what's happening is um, in the hill country, uh, the Israelites are on one side, the Philistines are on the other. The hill comes down, and there's a valley uh, in between. And neither one of the armies really wants to come down and fight in the valley. They want the upper hand. They want to be in the high country. So they're sort of at a stalemate. Neither one of the armies is coming out. But um, Goliath is using this opportunity to try and taunt the Israelites to come down into the valley and fight. Verse 3, the Philistines were standing on one hill, the Israelites were standing on another hill, and there's a ravine between them. Then a champion named Goliath, and in this particular uh, translation that I'm using, actually uh, translates for us the units of, of measure, right? So we, we find out that Goliath is nine feet, nine inches tall. And let's, let's just cover that for a second. Nine feet, nine inches tall. Okay. The, the world's tallest man that we have a record of. So he was eight feet, 11.1 inches. So he's just a skosh under nine feet tall. Goliath is listed as nine feet, nine inches tall. So he's huge. Um, some ancient copies of the scripture um, that I think that's six cubits in a span. And some of the other uh, versions have four cubits in a span, which would make him six foot nine. So really regardless of what number we use and determining ancient measurements is tough. I mean, we're talking about how did they measure something, you know, 6,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, something like that, you know. Regardless, he's, he's a big guy, right? Uh, six foot nine. Those of you who come to Harmony Bible Church, right? Mark, he's six foot eight. <laughs> when he walks in a room, he gets noticed. I'm, you know, right here is the, the doorway into the sanctuary. He has to duck his head to get into the sanctuary. He literally has to be careful of ceiling fans. Right? So even if we use the smaller figure, Goliath is taller than Mark. I mean, he's a, he's a big dude. Um, he's got a bronze helmet, scale armor that weighs 125 pounds, and uh, his, his spear has got a head on it that weighs 15 pounds. So he's a big guy with lots of armor and the best military equipment that could be had. 
So here's Goliath. He, he's, he's, and, and so what's going on here is this sort of ancient idea of, hey, wait, let's not fight this out as, you know, two armies. You send a representative and we'll send a representative and whoever wins, you know, that person is declared the winner. That's, that's uh, what Goliath is saying. You send out your guy, bring him out to fight me. If you can imagine Mark, hey, whoever wants to come fight me, you know, I'll take on whomever you send. Anybody want to volunteer for that? No. So uh, he's yelling, he's taunting the Israelites in 8. Verse 12, Jesse sends his son David to check in on his brothers. Gives him some roasted grain, some bread, some cheese. Sends him out to the battle lines. Hey, check in on your brother, uh, brothers. Let me know how they're doing. Um, this food is for them. Give the cheese to their commander. See how things are going. So, verse 20. Uh, David gets up and goes. He's uh, he's talking with the guys there, and and uh, Goliath comes out, starts taunting the Israelites again as he's done every day. And this time, David hears it, and and David had heard that the king. Oh, I want to go back to this. Go back to uh, verse eleven. When Saul. And all Israel heard these words from the Philistine. They lost their courage and were terrified. So Saul's the king. He is the leader of the Israelites. He is the, the he is supposed to be the head of the battle formation. He's supposed to lead the Israelites in the battle. And what does it say? He's afraid. He's the king. Now we've got David here who, remember in the last chapter, he's been anointed king. He's going to be the future leader. And, you know, hey, what, what, did, what did King Saul say? Whoever wants to go out and fight this guy, um, he, he gets to marry the princess and doesn't have to pay taxes. His brother um, gets mad at him says, you know, hush up, kid. David saying, you know, what's your problem? So, sounds like, almost sounds like my house a little bit. What have I done now? Verse 29, I was just asking a question. And he inquires, you know, is this really true? What, what King Saul says? So he goes to Saul and, you know, Saul says, no, you're just a kid. This is a trained military fighter, a giant, and, you know, you can't beat him. And David says, verse 34, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it. I struck it down and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine is going to be one like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And here's, I think, the key for David. The Lord who rescued me, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. So note that David is not saying, I'm a beast, I'm awesome, I'm all that, I've killed lions and bears, and I'm going to go out and off this guy. No, he's putting all of his trust in the Lord. He's saying, look, the Lord has done this for me in the past. I am confident that the Lord is going to do this for us in the future. And so Saul is convinced and basically says, all right, I'm essentially what he's saying is I'm too afraid to do it, even though I'm the leader. Why don't you go ahead and do it, David? not knowing that David has secretly already been anointed king. 
So he tries on uh, Saul's armor, and he's not used to it. Now, you also, some of you may also remember that Saul, uh, King Saul, was uh, was mentioned as being a handsome fellow who was tall. He's he's already tall. Saul, I, I, my my memory serves me. I should have looked this up. He was a head taller than your average person. So he already is a, a big guy. So David is now trying to put on this armor and he's, he's, he can't carry it. It's, uh, he's not used to it. And he says, so I'm not going to use it. So he took his staff in his hand, verse 40, and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. So a wadi is a brook. Um, uh, and it's not always, uh, it doesn't always have water in it, only during the wet season, but it then dries up. Uh, also interesting, this um, shepherd's bag uh, that's mentioned in verse 40, it's the only time in the Bible that that word is used in Hebrew, that shepherd's bag. Huh. So, with a sling in his hand, he approaches the Philistine. So, this is important, I think. He's coming towards the Philistine. 41, verse 41, the Philistine came closer and closer to David. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a uh, youth, healthy, and handsome. So, he's close enough to David to see that he's just a kid. Am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? He cursed David by his gods. Come here, says the Philistine. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. So he's talking smack, smack talk, which uh, apparently was also uh, a pretty common thing back in the day when you were having warfare hand to hand. And look how David responds again, verse 45. David says to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Not I'm going to kill you, but the Lord is going to hand you over to me. Today, I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. And then all the world will know that I, David, am a great king and I'm going to come forth and declare my political might. Nope. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord. He will hand you over to us. Uh, and so I think that's I think that's really the key to this entire story, which it's not about David's skill. Um, I suppose it is somewhat about David's courage, but that comes from the Lord God Almighty. And David is quick to give him um, the glory that's due him. So then the Philistine starts forward and David also runs forward in verse 48. So these guys are getting close together. David puts his hand in his bag, takes out a stone, slings it and hits the Philistine on the forehead. Okay, so now we're coming to the portion of, the, of Heather's question, which is essentially, how do you kill a nine foot guy with a rock? When I was uh, a kid growing up in downtown Spruce Head, America, hashtag. Um, I made slingshots um, frequently. Uh, mine were like uh, Dennis the Menace. You know, you take a piece of Y-shaped wood. Uh, we had alder trees that grew in the back of my house, so I would go and hack a piece off. Uh, we went through many iterations of the slingshot my father would help me try and figure out how to make the best slingshot. We started off with rubber bands, which uh, don't give much. Um, my dad found a patch of leather for a pouch, so I had that. 
Um, I seem to remember we used uh, inner tube, rubber from inner tube to try and make the elastic bands. This was, nowadays I guess you can, you can go online and you can order specific, um, you know, elastics design for making slingshots, but we didn't have that back in the day. Um, a bungee cord, um, uh, a little later, so after I was a little older and sort of had grown out of slingshots, uh, my brother secured from somewhere one of those slingshots that, you know, sort of go against your wrist and it used um, surgical tubing as the uh, elastic material. Well, that's not, the, that's not the slingshot that we're talking about here. Um, it was very common for soldiers, ancient soldiers, to use slings. And uh, interestingly, this account here in the Bible is the, is the earliest known written record of the sling. And you've probably seen this, maybe you haven't, but probably you have. It's a uh, length of rope, twine, string, something, a pouch in the middle. Um, there's a, a loop on one end that goes around one finger and then the string comes down and then there's the pouch and then there's another piece of string. It's got a little knot in it that you hold here and you put your rock in the pouch. And uh, um, seems like according to my research there are a couple of ways that you can, I mean the way that we always see it is we always see it slung around the head this way, right? Um, but apparently also there's an underhanded method where you can sling that way. And there's actually a figure eight method where you would sling this way. And apparently, I'm, I've never used a slingshot of that type, but apparently the idea is that once you get it in motion, you're not actually swinging very hard. You're just doing this to get the rhythm down. And then it's only on the last mm, that you sort of put all your weight into it and you sling the stone and you let go and the stone flies. Um, as a weapon, it's actually really surprising what you can do with a sling. It was, for its day, it was essentially, it was the gun of its day. The idea was you are throwing a projectile at your enemy. If you were to just, apparently, if you just use your slingshot and just throw it, uh, somebody who is schooled in this can throw a rock 1,300 feet. So that's like a quarter mile. Uh, it, it, goes, it goes a ways. The, uh, the Romans and the Greeks uh, used slingshots. Um, the Babylonians used slingshots. The Romans and the Greeks actually would use, uh, instead of just using rocks, they would actually cast these like little lead bullets. They look, they, they look sort of like bullets. They're sort of oblong um, and they would fling these. They would put um, holes in either end. So as this thing was flying, the wind would go through the little holes in the object and would make sort of a whistling sound. Um, and these little lead things, because they're smaller than rocks, they would fly faster and penetrate better. And then also just the sound, so you wouldn't be able to, they're, they're, because they're smaller, you wouldn't be able to see them, where you might see a rock being thrown at you. These little lead things were less likely to be seen. And so they would, this sound, you would just be able to hear the whiz of these essentially lead bullets being flung at you. Um, and the, the Greeks and Romans, actually, when they would mold these things, they would actually um, mold messages onto them. Things like, take this, or catch, sort of taunting their enemies. You may have seen, like, you know, 
World War II bombers, you know, and the soldiers would, you know, paint something on the bombs, you know, here, Hitler, take this. They were doing it uh, back then. I found a great video online about a guy who taught himself how to use a slingshot. And he practiced for a year. And at the end of the year of, of practicing, uh, he could, from 30 feet away, he could hit a milk jug. So if you imagine my head, right, that's about the size of a milk jug. At 30 feet, he could hit it three out of four times. And at 45 feet, he could hit that size target every other time. And he, he practiced for a year. And in that year, he could sling so quickly that the end of the sling, when he would let it go, was moving so fast it would break the sound barrier and it would crack like a whip. That's how hard he was throwing this thing. He trained for a year and he said at the end of that year, this is how good he was. And he said that if you were from an indigenous country, you know, where, where using slings was, you know, a part of your life, he was as good as a kid. That's how good the kids are. According to him, somebody who's trained with these things can hit a torso-sized target at 150 feet. How far apart are David and Goliath? You know, it, it doesn't say, but we do see in the text that they are both running towards each other. We know that Goliath is able to identify David as young and handsome. Um, this guy who, after a year, he can hit a milk jug-sized object four out of five times. How long has David been using his sling, right? He's probably been using it since he's a youth. Is David accurate enough to hit the head of a giant? Well, it seems to me that he was probably plenty well trained that he could hit something that big. Well, how does this how does this kill the giant? Well, if you remember your physics um, force is mass times acceleration. And as I mentioned, the, the sling is kind of the bullet of its day. So when you throw the rock, it's not traveling as fast as a bullet, but the projectile that you're throwing is much bigger. It's rock sized. So according to what I found online, for a short distance, again, this is, I mean, yes, what did I say, it was 1,200 feet? Somebody could, 1,300 feet, right, if you just lob it. If you're on top of the, you know, a fortress or something like that, and an army's coming at you, and you're just, you're just throwing rocks down on top of your enemy, 1,300 feet. But, you know, this guy at, you know, 50 feet, could hit milk jug sized object. Now, if you're throwing a rock, you know, this big, the mass of that rock, even though you're throwing it slower than a gun shoots a bullet, mass times acceleration. Acceleration is down, but the mass is up. So according to the figures that I found online, a rock coming out of a sling puts out the same force as a nine millimeter gun, which is what the you know military uses for a handgun is a nine millimeter. Um, one test I saw online basically said it's about the same force as a 357 magnum. 
Well, that's a lot of force. And though a rock may not penetrate the way that a, a bullet would, imagine getting hit in the head with a rock traveling that fast. So I, I think the biblical account, I, I don't have any, have any issue with it. So, so basically in verse 49, David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, hit the Philistine on the forehead. So the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down into the ground. Okay, clunk. He goes over. Verse 50, David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. So I think when we say that he killed him with the stone, I think that's not quite what happened. I think what happens is he defeats him with a stone. He kills him. It's not so much the stone. I don't think that kills him because then verse 51 says, David ran over, stood over him, grabbed the Philistine sword, pulled it from its sheath and used it to kill him. So he, he actually, he sort of, the stone sort of knocks him out. He falls over. He can't fight. David comes up, grabs the guy's own sword, which is uh, in that day also, um, what's the word I want? Um, word's gone right out of my head, but it's not, it's not cool to be killed with your own sword by your enemy. Um, so he takes his sword, kills him, and cuts off his head. This, of course, causes the Israelite army. They rise up. They're like, woohoo, let's go get these guys now. God has shown us the victory is ours. And, and it's all because um, David trusts in the Lord. Um, as, as we saw from the earlier verses, it's not David's might. It's not... I mean, is it because David is skilled with a sling? Well, I suppose it's in part that, but that's not the important part. Um, what's the important part? David attributes it to God himself. The reason that they win is because of what God does through David, not because of what David does in his own strength. All right, anything else in my notes that I want to mention? Well, the only other thing that I wanted to mention that I didn't actually say is uh, regarding the sling. In First Chronicles 12, it's mentioned that David has some elite troops. And what can these elite troops do? Not only can they use the sling, but they can also use the sling with the left hand. So even if their right hand were to be injured for whatever reason, these guys can still fight with their left hand with the sling so it just shows you that it's it's kind of a primary weapon all right how can david defeat a giant with a rock answer when god is on your side and you are depending on him he's going to use those humble tools to accomplish his will hey thanks bill that was great Probably a little too long. <laughs> Let's do the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. I-J-E-S-U-S. The one I love the best. He died for me on Calvary. J-E-S-U-S. Next week, will we finally get to that Hebrew word? Will we talk about why there's a discrepancy in Goliath's height? Maybe. See you then.